Right, hi everyone. Um, I'm Stefano. I'm a, I'm a fellow at AMD. And good morning, everyone. I'm Bertrand Marquis. I'm a principal software architect at ARM. Um, so today we will um, present you um, something around safety certifying on open source project and the specific example of Xen. But before, I want to start by giving you some background on why we are doing that. So the automotive market um, is going towards more and more um, software in cars. We all see it uh, every day where our cars are, for example, more helping us. We have more driving assistance where the car is following the lines. In some cases, it's almost driving for us. I say almost. You need to, uh, to keep an hand on the wheel at the moment, sadly, but it will come. We have more and more entertainment system where our cars have lots of screens with music, games, etc. Evolved GPS system. And we have more and more connectivity. Our cars are connected to have uh, real-time uh, traffic information, but we also have applications on our phones where we can stop, start our cars, see where it is, and so on and so forth. And a lot of cars right now are even doing software updates over the air. Uh, you don't need to go anymore to service your car to do some, uh, some of the software updates. And autonomous driving um, is actually coming. That was seen as something impossible five or 10 years ago. But right now, there is no car manufacturer in the world which is not working on autonomous driving. So this is really something coming. When is, uh, is the big questions? So we have more and more critical workloads on our cars. Um, this is making uh, new constraints. The software complexity is increasing. We have video processing. We have intelligent, uh, artificial intelligence system used to recognize the objects uh, on videos. And we have more and more computing power in the car. Uh, it has been some years that uh, we have had a lot of MCUs in the cars, but up to now it was more or less microcontrollers or small processors. But with autonomous driving, we are going towards more server-grade system because the autonomous driving stack is requiring a lot of computing power. And this is making um, new constraints which are new to the automotive market. Um, the automotive manufacturers are going towards and safety certification because they need to have a better quality on their software stack. But the public authorities are also looking at that. Cars are a system on which you can potentially be killed. And the software, the, uh, the public authorities will enforce some kind of official certifications for software in the future. This is kind of what we had in the past in the avionic markets, in railway markets, where there is a public authority saying, you cannot fly a plane unless we checked uh, that your software was right. And this is actually not limited to the, um, to the automotive market. There are more and more systems out there which are autonomous and can potentially harm lives. That's some IoT system used in medical environment. There are some robots in the industry, but those robots are coming to your home uh, tomorrow. And there are some drones. Those drones are flying alone in the air. They can harm people if they, uh, if they crash at the wrong place. So they will go also towards some, uh, some safety constraints in the future. So we are going toward the software-defined um, vehicles, which means the software stack will become a lot more complex. We'll have multiple OS, AirTOS, applications running on uh, one single MCU. And it will be, will be based on heterogeneous architectures to, um, to optimize the power consumption. So you will have server-grade Cortex-A processors for video processing, intelligence, artificial intelligence, and so on. Some Cortex-A processors for real-time critical workloads, and you will still have some small Cortex-M processors to have computation done nearer to the, uh, to the actuators, so for brakes, for engine management, and for things like that. All those systems will be interconnected, but will also be updatable remotely. Um, this is something which is, uh, which is brand new. And we have also a trend on on-demand features, which means you will buy your car and you will be able to add more and more features, which will be purely software-based in the future. Mercedes is going towards that. If you look at uh, what they do right now, um, you can buy your car, and four months after, you can go online and say, hmm, it's winter, it's cold, I want to eat my seat. You go online, you pay for a month, for two months, for three months. Remotely, the feature is activated, and you have eating system for your seat. The summer, you turn this off, you stop paying, and you can turn more and more uh, features of your car on remotely. This is something kind of new. 
Um, so on the, on the right of the slide, uh, you see what the, uh, the SOFI project has been um, thinking of as an architecture for cars. What you see here is an hypervisor-based system with several operating systems. Then on top of this, you have containers to uh, deploy application. And what is new on the top is you have the cloud. What is the goal of this is actually to develop, test, maybe certify software remotely on the cloud and do deployment directly from the cloud to the cars. This is to, uh, to speed up the, uh, the development to market time in automotive. So all the system will be hypervisor based. And that's not only on server grade CPU anymore. Uh, we, will, we have hypervisor support on Cortex-A processor, but now we have also hypervisor support on Cortex-Air processor. And hypervisor technology will be mandatory. Main reason is that safety, critical uh, certification costs a lot. So you want to reduce this to the safety features. And hypervisor technology, which is uh, providing new partitioning, is allowing those kind of uh, certification opti uh, cost optimization. So the market is in need of um, more standardization. And ARM is leading or participating to a lot of initiatives in, those area, in this area. So first, for, uh, you have the SOFI project. That was the, um, uh, the architecture that I presented before, where automotive manufacturers, um, well, uh, processor uh, designers, and software engineers are setting themselves together to try to define a base architecture which will be used in automotive systems. A uh, global platform, uh, they are focusing on secure services and they have uh, an automotive um, working group. Uh, system ready, which tries to define a base architecture and boot requirements. FFA, which aims at uh, securing se secure workload or isolating secure workloads and standardizing the, uh, the interface between uh, normal and secure world and lots of other initiatives. The goal of all those initiatives is to um, let automotive manufacturers focus on their added value or the difference they have to other automotive manufacturers so that they have a base software stack that they will reuse among cars, but their application where they have a, a difference among uh, other automotive manufacturers, this one will be specific to them. Um, there is also a big need to reuse software. You cannot have one specific software stack per, uh, per car anymore. So the standardization will allow to have one functionality provided by uh, one company, and you will be able to reuse it on different systems or move it between cores if the base architecture is standard. Um, so open source uh, safety certification has a role to play in there. Why is that? It's because if we move towards standardization, open source becomes a possible answer as where several manufacturers or industry actors can pull their forces together so that uh, they share the certification cost. This way, it can cost them less, and they can certify bigger and more complex software. And this is a trend we see, because there are several um, open source projects. We are going towards that, and it's, it's sponsored by company. You have the ELISA project for Linux, the Zephyr project, which is going to certification, and the Xen project, where myself and Stefano are working towards certification. So the Xen project is critical for ARM. That the, type one hyper, the reference type one hypervisor. We use it to demonstrate what our CPUs can do and do some research and proof of concept on, on new features. The SOFI project is using Xen as uh, the reference hypervisor. And we have several development ongoing at ARM. So PCI pass-through, MPU, uh, FFA support are some good examples. And we have a big team of um, engineers actually working on Xen related technologies and contributing to the open source project, including myself as a maintainer and as a member of the FUSA group. Xen is also the uh, AMD open source reference uh, hypervisor for embedded and automotive for both ARM and AMD x86. Uh, we have an in-house team of engineers to develop and enhance the, uh, the hypervisor, you know, Xen, for embedded and automotive. If you follow Xen Devel, you will recognize many of the names of the people in my team. Um, Xen is given to customer and is supported via forum, premium support, and uh, engineering. So I'm going to highlight some of the features here, not necessarily, you know, to let you know about features of Xen, but because you'll see that are relevant for safety. 
And uh, as an example, um, some of our customers um, on the ARM side, uh, they're using Zen for real-time isolation. So they're using, they're running a real-time workload in one, v in one VM and a regular Linux, larger Linux workload in a different VM. And Zen is used uh, to enforce separation and enforce isolation of, of real-time um, properties. So Xen has a, has a, uh, is a, is a very as a very diverse open source community is a Linux Foundation project. There are a number of contributors. This is actually an older an, an older pie chart of contribution. And uh, George, the community manager, just with this week had uh, the new pie chart for the last 12 months. Uh, AMD had the uh, is the third uh, contributor. Um, so it's like like the yellow, um, uh, roughly the yellow um, chunk in this one. Um, again, I'm going to take this opportunity to highlight what is important for safety here. So uh, we have an independent panel of experts reviewing um, code uh, in Zen project. What this means is, in, you know, at companies often happens that, yes, you have reviewers reviewing the code, but then you are tight on schedule, you are close to the deadline, your bonus is at stake, and the patch gets committed. Right? We all have seen it. And you know, if an open source project is open by license, but is still you know dominated by one company, that can happen in open source project too. It's not going to happen on Zen. We all the maintainer work for different companies. We have maintainer from I don't know Amazon, uh, Citrix, uh, uh, Suzy, and, and you know you name it. So it's no, there is no way to to push through your bad code because you, you know your bonus is at stake. So um, that's also another thing that is very important for safety. Um, uh, so this is a, a, again a, a, like a, uh, a chart of all the companies uh, using Zen in different um, verticals, uh, and uh, yet again uh, highlighting it for safety reasons. So, so if you look at the top right, that's uh, data center. Top left, cloud. Bottom right is embedded, and we, we are there. But I want to highlight bottom left. Bottom left are a bunch of projects and companies that work Zen, that use Zen as their core for security properties. These are security companies. Uh, having, you know, either developing, selling, or uh, having open source projects based on Zen to do security. As an example, one that is famous is Cubes. Cubes is uh, an environment for your laptop to separate, you know, an environment to keep sensitive information and um, f separate it from whenever you browse the web, uh, a normal website, normal work environment. That's, uh, it became famous when Snowden famously recommended to use cubes to separate sensitive information from the rest. So, um, I'm gonna, so see, here are some of the reasons why making Zen safety certifiable is viable. And uh, I'm not gonna say easy because it's never easy, but easier than other projects, uh, easier than other open source projects. So, um, and, and some of these key, uh, you might, you know, if you work on your own open source project, you have a different open source, source project, you'll see that you might have some of these key characteristics and, and then it applies to you too, right? So one key characteristic is that um, we have a very, like I mentioned, we have a very strong uh, quality and validation process in, the, in this, I mean, quality review, like the, the independent panel of experts I was mentioning earlier, uh, it's famously difficult to get coding Zen. Like we get regular complaints from contributors that it's too hard, the reviews are too strict, too many iterations, and normally it's not a good thing, but here we're talking about safety. It is a good thing, right? You don't want bugs to slip in. Of course, if you're a project that your top priority is velocity, right, you want to go as fast as possible, that doesn't necessarily, you know, it's just a good thing for you, right? But if you want a project that you have the smallest possible number of bugs or the best architecture and that without compromise, then this is a very good thing for you. And if you want to run Zen on a car and, you know, uh, put in a way your life at stake, then you definitely you need this kind of quality control. Um, another thing is the security process. So Xen, uh, also because of the background on the data center, uh, cloud, and also all the, the security company I was mentioning earlier, as always, uh, I had a strong focus on security. And security and safety, we all know they're different things, but they share a lot of common themes, uh, like attention to quality, for sure. 
Um, and um, exam project is a very strong security process in place, very well detailed, and has been used as a model for many other open source projects, including OpenStack and, and others. That I, I wouldn't be able to name them all because it was uh, like the, the granddaddy of all the uh, other um, open source security processes. Um, so security and isolation are top priorities for the project. Has been for a number of years. We have full traceability. This is another thing that cannot happen with Zen. So you know when your colleagues come to your desk and tell you you really need to commit that patch, and then one year later he leaves, and then never, nobody ever knows anymore why that patch was committed? That cannot happen on Zen, because all the communication is on Zen Devel, on the mailing list, and is archived back 20 years. So there is no unknowns. Um, uh, we have two CI loops. Now, uh, one um, is, is called OSS test, testing on real hardware. Another one is GitLab CI. Now, also testing on real hardware as well as uh, QM and other emulation environments. And we have wide deployments on a number of places where they might not be safety critical today, but they're still somewhat critical, like the real-time se separation I was telling you earlier. We have uh, Cubes user, that, that's definitely critical for them, right? The isolation between sensitive and non-sensitive material. And even data center and cloud, you know, uh, the hypervisor there still play a critical role because you don't want your credit card data in a VM to be, you know, uh, stolen by another VM just because they're running on the same host. Um, AMD is uh, working on making Zen safety certifiable for AMD platforms, both x86 and ARM. Uh, we are targeting I661508 CL3 and ISO 262 uh, D. So ISO 262 is the one for automotive and IC61508 is a standard for industrial and uh, they are roughly equivalent. So they're, they are similar uh, in level of um, requirements and strictness. Um, so what I want to highlight that maybe is the most important thing of, of, of if you have to have one takeaway, uh, that's the one takeaway of this presentation. Open source was certified before, right? It's not, so this is not the first. So, however, in the past, what used to happen is a company would take the open source project, would take a tarball release, fork it, do a bunch of things on top of it, in a way become complete owner or whatever was that open source project, Safety certified, and from that point on, maintain it in-house. So yes, the open source code was originally open source, and in license is still open source, but in all extents, I mean, that became a company product, basically. A company managed through regular company workflows and processes, and, and never to get back to the community, right? Um, in fact, more, many of these places where open source were, were self, self, was safety certified are not public because they you know, became part of a project and nobody will ever know exactly where this open source software was run. And Xen is one of these projects that went through this with, with companies before. Now, um, this is different. The, what is new here, uh, we are actually working on Xen safety certifiability based on the open source projects open source processes, open source software releases, open source everything. So when we are write you know, uh, safety artifacts describing the quality control process, we are gonna describe the upstream quality control process. Right? So when we are gonna describe the tool that we use for development and testing, we are gonna describe the open source and upstream development tools and testing. Um, this is, uh, a great step forward for two reasons. One reason is we're gonna be able to get back a lot to the community, right? So we're gonna get back, uh, we are working today on Misra C. Uh, we have sponsored a full Misra C course to all the, uh, the key maintainers and many of the key uh, community members. Uh, we are also uh, working uh, in partnership with Bugsang to make Xen fully Misra C compliant. There is way more to come and you'll see in the coming slide. So we'll be able to give back a lot more to the community. And also, you know, egoistically, we'll want to be able to rebase this in the future, right? That's the problem with the other approaches. It's gonna be like a frozen snapshot, a frozen snapshot in time, you're never gonna be able to update. Now, here we want to be able to update maybe not for every exam release, but 
maybe every other exam release. So uh, be because we are gonna target open source processes and, and releases, we'll be able to um, update with, well, non, not zero effort, but a relatively small effort. Um, and like I said, um, not everything will be open source or that uh, will do, but many things will be, most things will be. I mean, some artifacts might be only available to AMD customers, but the, all the Miser C work is public and upstream, not just public, upstream. So, and um, the documentation of public interfaces, documentation of boot interfaces, it's, that has not started yet, but we want to make it public and upstream in the project. And, and GitLab testing, GitLab CI testing, so uh, we want to make many of the tests um, public and upstream. Um, so for the people of you uh, that are curious about what we're targeting, um, uh, like I said, ARM and AMD x86, uh, only the new um, uh, hardware, like, um, like um, we assume AMD V, AMD VI, HPET, you know, PCI on, on the x86 side, on, on the ARM side, SMMU V3, GIG V3, and, and so on. We you see, Xen doesn't have that many drivers, so uh, it's a pretty easy selection, and it's also, because it doesn't have that many drivers, it's also easy to update in the future, so, so we think it's gonna be easy to move it to a um, newer uh, generation, a newer family of, of boards. Um, so Xen only has driver for timer, timers, interrupt controller, SMMU, MMU, maybe a UART, and you know, that's pretty much it. Um, so there are no OS hypervisor dependencies. It means you're gonna be able to, to run whatever you like on top, whether it's uh, Linux, uh, so QM uh, is a shorthand to say this is not an environment safety certified, right? So you're gonna be able to run Linux QM or whatever, or Android QM, whatever you like. You're gonna be able to run Zephyr as safe West, you're gonna be able to run proprietary safe RTOSes, Nucleus, VxWorks, you name it. You can run anything you like in any, in, in any combination. You can run more than one. You can have Zephyr safety certified and Nucleus on one end, and you can have also Linux and Android, right? That you're, you're not limited to two VMs. You can have four, five, six, uh, depending, depending on the hardware and your customer needs. Um, we are gonna also include component for VM to VM, VM communication, so you're gonna be able to uh, exchange data between the VMs. We are gonna use HyperLounge, which is basically this feature to boot all of the VMs in parallel, uh, which uh, not only shortens the boot time significantly, uh, but also um, uh, it means, you know, you don't necessarily need to have any specific Xen knowledge in any of the VMs, because the environment is basically pre-configured by Xen at boot. So, uh, you could run all VMs that are not Xen aware. Um, uh, you are, we're gonna be able to protect safe VM from the non-safe VM, so you, of course, I mean, this is the kind of thing that goes without saying, but it's better to say it. The whole purpose of this is to protect the safe VM from the non-safe VM, and also one safe VM from another safe VM. So that's obviously the use case. Um, on x86, there are, I, if you're curious, you know, Xen has a number of um, uh, VM types on x86, and we're gonna target only the latest and, and, and best, which is PVH. Uh, it's a fully static configuration, so you boot, you get your four or five VMs, and we are not, you're not gonna create any more VMs, right? At the, at the moment, you, you know, those, those are the VMs created to boot. Uh, we are definitely gonna support real time. On ARM, we can go down to uh, three, four microseconds of latency, RQ latency. Uh, with interference. Um, most devices, we expect them to be directly assigned, so one thing you can do with Xen is you can take one DMA-capable device, like the network card, and assign it to one VM, take the GPU, assign it to another VM, you know, mix and match in any way you like. Um, and you're still gonna be able to do device sharing, and one of the things that, one of the things that is unique to, is it working? Um, One of the things that is unique to Zen is, uh, I mean, at, at least it's uh, uncommon otherwise, is that you can uh, share the device, uh, assign a device to a VM, and then share it with other VM, no matter what. Should I disconnect and reconnect? So in the meantime, there are any questions on this? Uh, I'm gonna, the next, I was actually gonna finish, uh, that's my last, uh, that was my last slide on the Xen overview and I was gonna move to the description of what we're doing for the safety certifiability of Xen. So if you have any question before I move to the, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, you, you said that certification documentation and artifacts will be available to AMD customers. 
Right. No, 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 no extra code changes. No, 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 no. That code has at least can be Yeah, I'm using this word artifacts. It's not very precise. Uh, so, so when you uh, go to the assessor, you need to present a lot of documents, uh, PDFs. And I actually have a list in the following slide uh, of the things that you need to give, including a safety plan and uh, safety architecture. And um, those are the artifacts I'm talking about. Uh, there are no code changes that are expected to be uh, zero, literally zero code changes we want to have secret. I mean, that is also actually not an advantage, right, to have, because um, it, it's better and easier if the actual release uh, is, uh, open source turbo is, is basically as us from upstream. So uh, the goal is to have zero code changes that are private. Um, So um, I think it's, so Xen is, in a way, in terms of process, is similar to Linux. Uh, in terms of strictness, I think we are a bit more strict in general. Uh, I mean, I've been worked on both myself uh, and also on QEMO and other open source projects. Uh, I can say that uh, Xen uh, has a truly like line by line uh, review and scrutiny. That, uh, that, that goes even beyond. It happens sometimes in Linux, but depends on the maintainer. Right? So if you touch cer certain core files in, uh, in Linux, you will have something similar. But Linux is a very large project. There are very different maintainers that have a def very different style. Right? Uh, so you could imagine having only the strictest Linux maintainer in Xen, just to have a um, comparison. OK, I'm going to resume quickly. So what going to be able to do, and then I'm going to This is the last slide I was saying on the architecture. So you're going to be able to assign devices directly, like in this case, a CAN and GPIO to Zephyr, the safe OS. And then also assign devices like audio and GPU to, let's say, Linux, run the device driver and the PV backends in, uh, in Linux, and share these devices uh, with other VMs, right? Uh, and this can be done safely using carefully shared memory uh, without privileges on the, uh, on the Linux side. So the, Linux does not have to. One thing that is unique to Xen also is we are using Vertio with grants, which is a technique that allows us to run Vertio without privileges. That's not how normally it is used, which means the PV backend or Vertio backend on the left in DOMD, the, the Linux yellow environment, does not require any privilege over the other VM, which obviously is a condition that otherwise you couldn't really, uh, if your Linux can do anything to safe OS, safe OS is not safe anymore, basically, right? Uh, even if Linux was safety certified, because you lose freedom from interference. So, so this is something we are really aiming, you know, having isolation and freedom from interference, even when device sharing is in place. All right. so. Uh, the safety certifiability project is divided in two phases. The first phase is the one we are working towards now, which is a safety concept. Uh, at the end of the safety concept phase, phase one, you get a safety concept approval from the assessors. That basically is a letter signed by the assessor saying, you are on the right track, your plans are good. If you deliver, you eventually you know, get to safety certifiability or safety certification. Um, phase two is the one where the heavy lifting is done, and you actually need to produce all of the artifacts um, and the one that you see on the left are the famous, you know, what I've been calling artifacts. Uh, so this is a list of things that if you are an en a regular engineer, uh, you might, might not tell you much because they're using specific wording from the ISO 26262 spec, right? So when I say software safe safety requirements, you might have an idea what it is because these, these words in English mean something, but there is a very specific definition on what this is in ISO 26262. So uh, because um, I wanted to give you uh, also the people in the room that don't, you know, I have not safety certified something before, so they might not know exactly what these are beyond their English meaning of the word. I, uh, that's why uh, this is the same for the phase two, okay? Uh, this, I put this table on which is a kind of translation in plain English on what most of these things are, right? 
Um, and uh, one, the, the software safety requirement is basically a documentation of all of the expected behavior of the project, of, of Zen. Expected behavior depending on the configuration, expected behavior in case of errors, expect, all expected behaviors. The software, if you think why, you cannot make sure the software behaves correctly if you haven't documented what the behavior is supposed to be. So you need to know what the behavior is supposed to be to check that the behavior is correct, right? That's why you need to document it. Um, the architecture specifications, the description of the architecture, the, the main components, and the relationship between them. Um, MISRA C, so it's very important to have safe coding gu guidelines. Uh, MISRA C is basically what gives you, uh, uh, so C itself is not a safe language, so MISRA C builds safety on top of C. And that, uh, if your software is written in C, you definitely want to look into MISRA C. Um, verification and validation, this is over, you know, together is a whole set of tests. And keep in mind the testing safety need to be very strict. So everything that is run in your safety configuration needs to be tested. So the idea is, uh, you know, the behavior needs to be documented, is implemented, and then is tested. If you have things that are not tested, then it's not safe, right? Everything that you have should be tested. Now, this is when, you know, going back to projects like Linux, you can imagine, not, not you know, and, and Eliza is making progress, you can imagine that also, and, and also Zen today, honestly. Like, we have tests, but we don't have enough tests to test everything. We need to test everything here. This is the biggest effort in the project, the testing. Uh, there are a bunch of other things that are, in, are uh, not very intuitive but important, such as the software tools classification document. This is the document where you list all the tools that you use in development, of, but also testing. Things like your compiler, and you may think, why? I mean, you're going to compile with anything you like. Sure, but if you're using for all your tests and all your code validation on everything a compiler that is buggy and is introducing bugs between your, you know, in, in compilation phase, then all of your effort, you know, don't mean much. You, everything needs to be working from A to Z. That includes the compilation phase somehow, right? Doesn't mean you need to safety certify the compiler, right? But you definitely need to do, to at least qualify the compiler, and that's what this step is for. Uh, software failure analysis is, uh, as it says, is one of the most difficult steps, and it basically you need to look into all the possible failure modes and uh, describe how your software behaves. You have to make sure the software behaves correctly on, every, on, on each of the possible failure modes. Uh, and when I say correctly, it's the, as you thought it should behave, right? Um, and then there are all the safety management and process control uh, artifacts, such as what is your process to commit things, review things, you know, the safety plan, and so on. So overall is roughly, you know, in an estimate in our experience, 65% uh, of the work is really writing tests, and the rest is writing documentation. And roughly, for a project that is 50,000 lines of code, it can be done in two, two years, two, two years and a half. Um, and like I said earlier, uh, definitely we want to be able to update the, um, the overall um, set of artifacts uh, by, uh, you know, uh, uh, taking a new exam release. Maybe we have to rerun all the tests. Maybe we need to change a couple of tests. Maybe we need to add a couple of tests. But overall, we think it will still be applicable. Uh, input of the Xen community. Uh, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna spend the last five minutes to to, to talk about uh, how this I think improves the open source project. And this is uh, the takeaways that I'm gonna try to provide here is really to, um, uh, to to make you think how this is good for your own open source project. So these are le lesson learned that are really widely applicable. So first of all, if you safety certify an open source project or make it safety certifiable, you're going to let this open source project be run in a wide variety of environments that it was not possible to be run before. Like you couldn't run Xen on a critical industrial application without safety certifiability. You couldn't run it on cars, on trains, on, on planes one day. So the wider use means you're going to get more engineers, more people looking at the code. In general, this, the, your software will be healthier. Uh, that, that's kind of obvious, but what are the other, the more direct benefits? So, let's start from Misra. So, a, a lot of the, sa the, the, the safety is about, you know, code quality, and, and the um, open source project cares about the code quality first, 
right? Open source projects are all about the code more than anything else, right? This is why we're all, all, all in open source. So, Miser C is often, from the safety perspective, not the most important item compared to everything else. But for your open source project, it typically is the most important item because the people in your open source project are going to care more than anything about the code. So the things that are going to uh, you know, be impacted the most is by Misra. And what, what we find is really important about, about Misra is to explain to, uh, to the community why this rule is not just, you cannot go to the community and say, we have these 120 rules that you, we would like you to follow from now on, because otherwise we cannot get this piece of paper that allow us to gain business in this vertical. Now, that obviously uh, is not the right way. I try to make it look as bad as possible, but I mean, uh, in, in, in practice, you cannot just, you know, uh, push Misra to the community without explanation, right? You, you need to explain why this is useful, and you need someone that has the knowledge and the expertise to go and explain to why each rule is there, and there is a good reason for each rule. And you'll find that most of these rules actually apply to your project well. And you can select the rules that apply well to the project and decide the other to deviate or not, not follow them. Um, and the end result is you have uh, way better documentation of your coding guidelines. You also, uh, you can automatically scan for, uh, for violations. So now a lot of the review of trivial mistakes from contributors can be caught automatically with your Miseracy scanner, right? There are all of this attention uh, to safe language and in a way C plus Miseracy and the Miseracy checkers gives you what the safe language uh, gives you. Um, there is all of this attention about chat GPT now, and they talk about AI for coding. This Misra C static checkers, they're not AI, uh, in the sense that they're not uh, statistical. But they give you that advantage of checking the code in detail for a wide variety of errors. Um, and we have ways to uh, uh, write deviate, deviation, that which means we are not following the violation, we're not fixing the violations in this particular case. We're, we have a way to, 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 to record the, that information in the code itself in a generic way for multiple Misra C scanners. And we, we have Misra C scanners, or we are about to have Misra C scanners as part of the upstream GitLab CI pipeline so that we can scan for Misra C error Patches for contributors come from Miser C errors immediately before reviewers start even to review the code. Now, finally, we have what I always wanted to have, a bot that does review instead of me, right? This is, this is actually supposed to really offload a lot of the review um, to, to really a, a, a program. Uh, documentation, we haven't really started, but it's key to keep it up to date with the code. So you definitely want to look into Doxygen, RST, markdown files in your Git repository. And testing, I mean testing, open source projects traditionally have been not very good with testing, got a lot better in recent years with GitLab CI and other projects. And uh, testing is also the biggest one item, and we're working with GitLab. We have um, private, ru private runner, I mean, any community runners, anyone can contribute to their GitLab runner to make sure Xen is working well on their favorite boards, including one that is on my, on my desk in San Jose. And uh, you, you, we support more than 100 tests, and they're very easy to, uh, to add new and extend, and we plan to use that as infrastructure for, for, the, te for the safety testing. And um, I'm hoping to take questions, if I can. Okay. So, um, for this thing, are we covering uh, more than section testing and CBT testing? Yes, yeah, so we need a framework to inject failures, and we don't have that yet. So that's one of the things we're going to look into next year in the current plan. So we haven't started. You definitely need a testing framework that allows you to inject a, a, a failure, yeah. Right, no, so you're exactly right. So the goal of this is to be a reference for many other open source projects. Uh, 
uh, or, and also many others that want to safety certify also Xen or who, what, uh, all, all cases. Uh, and uh, what you just mentioned is one of the things that we are looking at right now, how to manage the requirements and discussing it. And there are a couple of things, options that we have already discussed. We want to make this all public for, for, for now. If you're interested, feel free to contact me. Uh, and uh, my email or LinkedIn are easy to find. And uh, I can provide all the details that we have so far. And there are lots of the meetings and documentation, but they're not as good as they should be. Yeah. This is also why I'm here, to, 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 to share our expertise. Um, for tool qualification, is that going to be something that's like given back to the community as well? Because say you probably have to qualify GCC or at least provide evidence that GCC is good. So you are right. And GCC has been qualified before, just for, for, for your information. Uh, has been even used in avionics, uh, as Bertrand said yesterday in another, in another conference. Uh, avionics has stricter rules than automotive, for your information. Um, so. Uh, um, so this, the, the, the tools classification document is one of those that I'm not sure if it's going to be uh, given back or not. So uh, the, the, we're still at the beginning. And so certain things I'm sure there will be. Certain other things I'm sure they're not going to be. And that one is kind of in the middle. Um, so. Other questions? I, I, cannot, I cannot say, but we're definitely in discussion with safety, safety assessors. Uh, we're working with them closely. Uh, and it's actually a necessary step to, to achieve the safety concept approval. I'm not going to name names here in a public stage, but uh, you can catch me later. Uh. Thank you for the very nice overview. Have you also, in, in addition to um, uh, increasing the test coverage, have you also considered any formal uh, methods like formal specification languages or formal verification methods like Promela, SPIN or TLA plus or something like that? So um, we had discussion about that and uh, I think it might be viable for a certain subset of the code. Now thankfully the, the Xen code is actually rel relatively simple. So, uh, but there are certain parts of the code that are not, not, not many, but one of them I have in mind in particular on the x86 side that is an instruction emulator, it's not so simple. So for those you need to want to have some extra. Uh, so I wouldn't, I think it's possible for some sort of subset of the code and in addition to the testing, like to a complement, like you were saying, I think that's, that could be a good idea. Project Y would be difficult because of spin locks and SMP and uh, these kind of things that typically are very hard to express altogether a project wide in those languages. So I don't think we're going to do it project wide. You know, somebody's going to ask this question. Are you considering having Rust to support Python? So, um, so the, the Xen I so differently from, so, so there is a mixed answer here. So, dif differently from Linux, Xen is very small, right? <clears throat> so on ARM today, without the improvement that we're going to make to make it smaller, is, is 50,000 lines of code. Um, so it makes less of a sense to add <clears throat> Rust in the core because we don't have like a device driver model, right? Like in Linux, because we don't have drivers, because we only looked at the at very core components. <clears throat> so adding Rust itself in the, uh, in, the, in the core, I think, makes less sense um, compared to other projects. I don't say it makes zero sense. So I think we, will, we could consider it. But, but on the other end, we have a lot more things running on top. It's more, it's, Xen has more like a microkernel approach, right? So, so you could easily run an, uh, an Artos written in Rust with some key drivers in there, fully Rust 100%, uh, with all your, you know, I don't know, network stack, all written in Rust as an example, and that would be totally fine, right? And also, like, all the Misra C, and there are other things coming, like C, uh, Rusted C, I don't know if you uh, heard of it, but we could introduce uh, many of the, um, we also, I mean, in parallel, there is also a point of introducing the same safety guarantees to C, right? So we can also do that. Right, I think that probably last question, but yeah. Sorry, uh, are there any hardware recommendations that you would like to see uh, from various vendors to meet the SLD, like lockstep CPUs or something similar? 
you need lockstep for sure for a certain level of ASL. Um, <clears throat> ASL is a safety critic, how strict safety needs to be, right? A is the least, D is the most. Uh, so lockstep is one. I think one thing that I cannot stress is enough that vendors don't often get right is the IOMMU. You need to have all of the DMA-capable devices protected with the IOMMU. Definitely a strong recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>